Have you ever wondered what language your brain speaks when it talks to itself? I'm not talking about your inner monologue, the voice in your head. No, I mean, when you look at a brain scan and you see all those brain regions in close, complex communication, do you ever wonder what exactly they're saying to each other? Is it like a computer's language of ones and zeros, just on and off logic gates? Or is it something totally different, something we don't yet even have the conceptual framework to properly understand or talk about? And how cool would it be if we could listen in on just a small region deep inside the brain and for a brief moment understand exactly what it's saying to the brain regions around it? Well, my guest on the podcast today is a guy who won a Nobel Prize in 2014 for doing exactly that. What's even cooler is that he did it with his wife, who's also a neuroscientist, and with one of his lifelong mentors, and all three of them won the Nobel together. The guy's name is Edward Moser, and along with his wife, May Britt, and his teacher, John O'Keefe, he won the Nobel for the discovery of what are called hippocampal grid cells. These are cells deep in the brain that actually map our perceptions of the physical world and locations in the physical world onto a tiled grid, almost like a game board. And he's here today to talk about how that process of discovery unfolded in episode 13 of the Connectome podcast. So, Edward Moser, Welcome to the Connect Dome podcast. Thanks for coming on the show today. So you ended up winning your Nobel Prize for discoveries in neuroscience, but you and your wife, Maybrit, who, like I said, you're now sharing a Nobel Prize with, you guys actually started out studying psychology at the University of Oslo. What was it that drew you both to psychology in those days? Well, that's somewhat random because um, we both had started at the University of Oslo and didn't really know what we wanted. But uh, I mean, there were several things that were interesting about psychology. One was that I had started reading Freud, so it was at least got me interested in human behavior. That was one reason. I thought it was a fascinating field, nothing more than that, really. And uh, the neuroscience part of it only came a little bit after when we got exposed to the whole range, uh, the whole field of psychology, which, which is very, very broad. Very soon noticed that uh, some things were a lot more interesting than others. And then we were in, interested in the study of behavior, behaviorism, but then missed really uh, the neuroscience component of it, which uh, at that time existed in a few pages of textbook of a thousand pages usually, and that was it. But it was enough to catch our interest. And then we tried to do as best what was possible at that time. We, we went to teachers that were around us that could help us with more literature. And we got this uh, 1979 issue of Scientific American, which still is being read because it contained really uh, the state of the art at that time and was also quite forward looking. So that was very exciting. For example, it has the final chapter in that issue was by Francis Crick, where he sort of speculated what was needed to get the neuroscience of behavior, where you really could explain behavior by neural activity. And much of that has now been fulfilled. So uh, all of this got us very interested. And then we searched around for people who, who knew something about neuroscience. It wasn't really many at that time at all, but then got in contact with the only psychologist who was actually working at the medical faculty who did some neuroscience. Uh, and that's sort of the same place where we later got in contact with Per Andersen. So you realized that uh, psychology alone wasn't cutting it. Was that a gradual transition or did that happen right away? No, it was quite gradual, so uh, we sort of felt it was natural because we started out with doing a, a small project with Terje Sagwalden, as I said. So he was working on hyperactivity and attention deficit disorder in rats. So we learned with him how to train animals, test them in Skinner boxes and, and sort of how to measure behavior and we learned a lot of statistics. But still, he was interested in... Um, 
in the modulation of behavior by dopamine uh, and noradrenaline, so by modulatory neuromodulators, uh, that sort of got us in the right direction, got us interested, but still the mechanisms of behavior, how behavior was created was still, was far away, was almost no one doing any of this. But then in the same institute, there were also other groups, and one of them was Per Andersen's group. That was the group where LTP, long-term potentiation, was discovered many, many years before. So they did a lot on plasticity of the brain and potential mechanisms for learning and memory, but they didn't study this in um, awake or behaving animals. So uh, that was the connection where we saw that we could have a role. Finally, we then went to Per Anders and, and got a place in his lab and then learned the techniques that were used there. But uh, it all felt natural because it evolved over several years. So I never really felt that there was a big barrier between the fields. The only barrier was that there was so little at that time that connected the two areas, namely uh, physiology and, and psychology. I mean, there have been some very, very important advances before, but still the whole field of psychology was really missing physiological explanations. Right, which was the actual reason for your transition. A lot of your most burning psychology questions, some of the deepest psychology questions, really, were going to need neuroscience answers. And that led you, I think, to the lab of John O'Keefe, who you now share the Nobel with. So John came after the PhD then, so we both did PhDs, two different PhDs with um, Per Andersen. And then when we had finished there, we, uh, partly as a result of the work that I did in my thesis, where basically what I showed was that if you measure brain activity with field potentials... Could you, sorry, could you actually talk about field potentials in a little more detail? Because for people who are listening, field potentials were a really important neuroscience concept at that time? So a field potential is essentially the sum of activity in in many neurons at the same time. So you can measure uh, one neuron at a time or you can measure maybe hundreds uh, at the same time. And that quite common at that time was to measure the summed activity of unknown number of neurons. And then this was used to relate it to LTP. Uh, That LTP, uh, long-term potentiation, was a suggested mechanism for strengthening synapses or connections between neurons that was thought to take place during learning. Right, so in those days, field potentials were basically regarded as a prime topic to study if you wanted to understand how learning took place in the brain. So you were working on field potentials, and in the end, that led you to the lab of John O'Keefe, who's now your fellow Nobel winner. In my thesis, I tested, tried to test whether such a phenomenon occurred naturally when animals learned. So whether learning caused a potentiation of connections between the cells, and then they used these field potentials. But the basic discovery was that actually there is a lot of variation in these uh, potentials that is caused by um, temperature changes in the brain, and that uh, if you remove those, there's only a little bit left, some of it may be related to learning, but it meant that it was quite difficult actually to study neural activity of learning and memory without really going directly to the individual neurons. So that was a big motivation then for us to actually learn how to record from individual neurons and then going to the hippocampus, which we already were familiar with from Per Andersen's lab. So it was quite natural to go to John O'Keefe in the end. And how long did you actually spend in O'Keefe's lab at that time? Oh, well, that was extremely short. So it wasn't, we weren't even involved in the project because for me it was three months, for my bit it was one month. And uh, the reason was that uh, at that time we started out as postdocs with Richard Morris in Edinburgh, but he didn't want to set up play cell recordings in his lab. That would be quite a big step for him at that time. So he suggested I go to London and rather learn it from O'Keefe. And then at that time, I already knew that I would take a position and Maybrit would also in Trondheim in Norway. So there wasn't much time left. But Richard then suggested I use the remaining time to learn the technique with O'Keefe. So um, O'Keefe took us in for that little period and really showed us, uh, spent a lot of time 
training us uh, and I learned every single aspect of doing play cell recordings, how to operate the animals, how to make the electrodes, how to turn the electrodes down, how to record the activity, how to interpret the signals and analyze and everything. So he spent a lot of time on me. I, I did a few animals that then I don't know if they ever used them for anything, but um, essentially it was a training period for me. Uh, that was enough so that when we left the lab three months later and had to go to Norway for this, uh, take up these new positions, we knew the basics of how to do things. Of course, not much experience, so we had to find out ourselves a lot afterwards, but uh, it was enough. Uh, as I often say, it was the most intense learning period in my life. I really learned a lot during that little time. Yeah, it sounds like that was where you learned a lot of the practical skills you would later use in your own research on the hippocampus. And so this takes us up, I think, to 1996, which is when you set up your own lab. Is that right? 1996, that's right. So as your lab launched, what was the first thing you started working on? Yeah, well, first of all, it took about half a year to set up the lab, but we began right away with uh, play cell recordings. Uh, we did a few other things too, a few other hippocampal studies that were follow-ups from the work we did with Richard Morris, which was more related to LTP. But uh, more and more, the play cell recordings took over. And one of the questions that we were particularly interested in was, uh, there were two things actually. One was whether there was any activity in play cells that could be related to learning. And, and the other thing was how was the play cell signal generated? Where did it come from and how was it made? And that is the beginning of the work and then through several steps led to the grid cells in the end. And that question about how grid cells work, although you didn't know it at the time, was ultimately what led you to your Nobel Prize. So let's talk about that question. What was it about grid cells that fascinated you? Yeah, well, what I thought was fascinating was that this is a, so, a signal in the middle of the brain that has such a clear correlate to something in the outer world, namely the position of the animal. So that is quite unusual because mostly when brain activity is in, in some way related to the outside world, you find it in the uh, first levels of sensory systems or at uh, the last levels of motor systems where you can sort of record the activity and then see that the activity pattern is related to something that happens in the outside world. But as you go deeper and deeper into the brain through more and more synapses, usually this is washed out and it's very hard to see any direct relation between activity and, and something in the outer world. Only a few exceptions and perhaps the most striking exception is the play cell signal because it is so clearly related to this outside property. Right, so you've got these intriguing little cells embedded deep in the brain, deep in the hippocampus, that seem to be talking to each other about something as literal as specific locations in the outside world. It's like, wow, here could be a way to start decoding the brain's inner language the same way you learn the first building blocks of any language, actually, by watching somebody point at different things in the room and listening to what they say for each thing they point at. And so you start to wonder, how much can we take this apart and actually start to understand what these cells, what the communication patterns between these cells are encoding? But then the question is, how can such a signal come about? Because it's not, it cannot just be a summation of activity that comes in through the senses, because that would, again, just wash it out. It was very fascinating. And at that time, there had been done studies that tried to address where the play cell signal originated. And people had actually even recorded in the entorhinal cortex, which is one step up of the hippocampus, the, exactly the same area where we later found the grid cells. But they had recorded in, in a kind of wrong part of entorhinal cortex, much deeper, so that they didn't really, even if there were grid cells, uh, most likely there were, they had, in that area, the grids are so big. I mean, there's a, so, such a big distance between the fields and the fields are so large that they missed the periodicity and didn't see it. And instead, the pattern was interpreted as something quite non-spatial, 
And then the implication from that work was that the play cell signal must arise in the hippocampus itself. But still, it felt a bit unsettled and uh, we were really intrigued by that, wanted to understand what was the role of each of the uh, computational steps in the hippocampus. And the hippocampus has uh, three, four different subfields, each doing their own thing. So we wanted to understand what, what is the role of each of these subfields and are they involved in the formation of the play cell signal. So what we did then was that since the hippocampus is quite unidirectional, we just took away with chemical inactivation the early steps in the circuit and then recorded in the late steps. I still saw that there was a play cell signal and then concluded that those early steps can't really be so critical after all for making the play cell signal. And then at the same time, we also had already been interacting quite a lot with Menno Witter in Amsterdam, an anatomist, who had then written papers uh, and worked on a direct connection from the entorhinal cortex to the hippocampus. So we're, we're really conscious about the possibility that perhaps the signal actually came from the entorhinal cortex after all. And then when we discussed with him in the end, then we found out that the recordings that had been done in entorhinal cortex had not been done in the right place. So perhaps uh, then it would make sense to go to the right place and then see if there was a spatial signal. And that's sort of the beginning of the grid cell story. So you implanted some electrodes in mouse's brains. You talk about this in your Nobel speech. You guys implanted wires in the mouse entorhinal cortex in this area you'd been looking at. And you recorded the activity of this area of their brains as they ran around in little boxes. And a pattern started to emerge, right? Well, it happened over a long time, actually, because the recordings showed that there was spatial activity, and that we published in 2004. So that each cell, unlike a play cell in a small, when a rat walks in a small box, each entorhinal cell had multiple fields, several fields, but they looked very regular, and we were very puzzled about that. But we didn't really see what the pattern was not quite at least and we discussed that a lot with the reviewers of the paper and we showed even that the distance between each of the fields is more similar than you would expect by chance so by inference that would be a hexagonal pattern because that's where you have the most similar distances between all of the fields so you gradually started to realize that the communication patterns of these cells these grid cells that you were studying, actually encoded a hexagonal grid, almost like a game board or a tiled floor. And each tile on the grid corresponded to a specific location in the external physical environment. This only happened later when we then decided, after we had presented these data at the Society for New Science meeting and got a lot of feedback, uh, even some people who said, uh, this looks very hexagonal, that we then decided to go home and expand the environment so that we could be sure that it actually is a hexagonal pattern. So then we expected that and then went home, made uh, the recordings in a hexagonal in a bigger environment and that confirmed it. And of course, that was a wonderful experience to see that actually it was uh, hexagonal already, although we already sort of suspected it from the data we had, but still found that it was too good to be true in a way. So it took took a few times to convince us. Uh, we were worried that it was an artifact of some sort and even worried that the equipment somehow generated electric spikes in a hexagonal pattern. So all of these things we had to go through to rule out. And finally, then uh, we could be convinced that it is real and is a hexagonal pattern. But that process itself took at least half a year. Like you said, it's amazing, uh, but it almost sounds too good to be true. Uh, So when you presented these findings for the first time, did anyone just respond like, no way, (laughs) there's just no way? No, I I think people understood it quite well. And we also understood then that this was rather important. And that was also the feedback we got when we presented this, even when it was unfinished and we presented it at the Society for New Science meeting. There was a lot of excitement about it because it was clear that what we had there was uh, a kind of metric for the spatial system in the brain that hadn't really 
been found so far. So uh, it was a missing piece in a way. And I think people were excited and, and we were excited ourselves too. So I knew it was important. It was a new cell type. It was part of the brain's metric for space. But, but nonetheless, the implications still became clearer and clearer over the years. So we actually, then when you start to think about how could such a pattern be generated, maybe it is a pattern that uses mechanisms that are used in other parts of the brain too, and so on. And, and we also saw the excitement among computational neuroscientists. So those with some mathematics and physics background were so excited about this uh, extremely regular pattern and how it could come about. So. Uh, in 2005, I never thought that this would lead to a Nobel Prize, but I, I knew it would change the field. That was pretty certain. So most people knew you had a major discovery on your hands. And of course, that was proven true when you and your wife, Maybrit and John O'Keefe shared the Nobel for this research in 2014. So let's talk about the Nobel. Did you have any suspicion that 2014 was going to be the big year? Yeah, no, no, it was, um, no, I think I was aware that it might happen sometime, but you you know, there are so many good people, so many great findings that whether it would happen to us or someone else, that <laughs> that would be uh, somewhat random. First of all, I knew myself it was uh, important finding, but the other thing is also that I knew that we were probably considered in Sweden because they, we had, at least they have invited us a number of times. And I don't know if that is coincidence, but they quite often invite candidates on symposia and so on. So I had the feeling that they were considering us. That was not a surprise. But what was a surprise to me was that it came already now. I thought they would spend more time to sort of see the implications before they would eventually decide whether it was important enough or not. So uh, I did not expect at all that it would happen this year. Yeah, for a Nobel, this was very quick. Nobels are often given out for discoveries that have loads of influence over like a 30 or 40 year period. But you guys only had to wait about 10 years for your Nobel. Yeah, exactly. So in physiology, that is rather short. Which I think says a lot for how important this work has already been. Yeah. So <laughs> I love to ask this question. Where were you at the moment you found out you'd won a Nobel Prize? Yeah, well, the secretary of the committee tried to call me, but that was not possible because I was in a plane. So I was flying from Norway to Munich and then the plane landed at 12.20. And this was and he called at uh, 10.30, I think. And it was announced at 11.30. So when I landed, everyone else knew, <laughs> just not me. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So from beginning to end, just a whirlwind of a story. You know, if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, and if you've been watching some of our videos and our other content here at The Connectome, you know that one of my favorite themes, a theme that just really resonates with me on a very deep level is the breaking down of that seemingly uncrossable boundary between the external world and our internal subjective experience of reality. And Edward Moser's co-discovery of hippocampal grid cells and how they work is one of those surreal moments where you almost feel like you're peering behind a veil, behind the curtain, and seeing a little glimpse of how our brains, not our conscious minds, but our brains themselves, interpret and process the world around us. So, that about wraps it up for episode 13 of the Connectome podcast. But we've got a lot more cool stuff coming your way soon. For example, next episode, I'm going to be talking with Bernard Bars, a neuroscientist who specializes in studying the structure of consciousness. Until then, have a great week, everybody. Go do some science! <laughs>